The neuropsychologist are PhDs or PsyDs. PsyD is a, is a doctorate in clinical psychology specifically, while a PhD is a doctorate in philosophy, an older degree. But they're not MDs. We're not medical doctors, which means we can't generally prescribe medications. You'll see an asterisk there because there are actually a few states now where they do allow what's called medical psychologists, which are prescribing providers with specialty training in version of certain classifications of medication. California is not one of those states, but if you're watching from another state, your state might be. Also, neuropsychologists generally don't perform surgeries or any medical procedures. They certainly might assist with part of the surgical process or even be in the room during some of the epilepsy surgeries which we'll talk more about during our time together, but we're not the ones doing any of the medications or cutting or interventions in that sense. Neuropsychologists are more than just therapists, so we do in fact ask psychologists have general training as therapists or psychotherapists, but we also have advanced specialty training in the area of neuropsychology. And our focus is really on the assessment, diagnosis, and really brief interventions as they pertain to your cognitive function. So if there is some Things psychological that's impacting your cognitive functioning, we might do some brief intervention around that. But really, our goal is to help you get an accurate diagnosis and a sense of your cognitive functioning to support your medical treatment. Again, we may briefly provide psychotherapy or what's called cognitive remediation or cognitive rehabilitation, which is essentially kind of personal training for your brain to help strengthen some areas of your cognitive functioning where there may be weakness or deficits on testing. Um, but again, our goal is not in primary treatment. All right, so let's break it down a little further from here. What is neuropsychology? Neuropsychology is, at its base or its foundation, the understanding of the brain behavior relationship. How we accomplish that, how we get a sense of the relationship between someone's brain and how that brain is functioning, meaning their behavior, is we use standardized, validated measures that look at all aspects of cognitive functioning. So in an effort to better understand the brain behavior relationship, there's a few points I want to make. It's a really complex relationship. We have some awesome tools at our disposal, thanks to modern medicine, things like brain imaging, different types of scans. You may have heard of MRIs or PET scans, or functional MRIs. But the reality is, is that our scans or pictures of our brain don't always tell us the full story. Sometimes we need, might see damage to certain areas of the brain, but someone might be doing pretty well on testing that involves that part of the brain. So that's why it's helpful to have not only the pictures of your brain, but also a sense of functionally how things are going, which is the gap that our test can help to fill. In. There's many factors involved in how your cognitive function is going. So overall, one piece of the puzzle, of course, is how you're feeling day to day, but there's lots of different aspects that can affect, of your life, I should say, that can affect your cognitive function. Things like sleep, mood, uh, stress, certainly, travel, all kinds of different pieces of it, so that can get a more comprehensive picture of the different aspects that are impacting your cognitive functioning. And as we mentioned, the neuroimaging or the other diagnostic tests we have are not always enough to really give us a sense of or better characterize the full picture of our cognitive functioning. That's where we can be helpful. All right, so who is a neuropsychologist? As we mentioned, a neuropsychologist has a doctoral degree in clinical psychology. And then that individual has also undergone specialty training in the field of neuropsychology, which is, again, the study of the brain behavior relationship. Generally, that's a two-year fellowship after we complete our residency and our doctorate. And then beyond that, neuropsychologists might have subspecialties within different areas. So, for example, neuropsychologists might specialize in traumatic brain injuries or in multiple sclerosis, in epilepsy, in geriatrics or aging. And some neuropsychologists might have a few different areas of focus, perhaps across their clinical and their research areas. Neuropsychologists who generally work with individuals with epilepsy are interested specifically in how the seizures affect the way that that individual thinks and remembers information. And that's what they're curious at. That's what they're getting to look at with their testing. All right, so why? Why should you go to a neuropsychologist? Well, your medical team might send you to a neuropsychologist to get a better understanding of the cognitive and functional impact of your epilepsy. The evaluation, again, can help us get a comprehensive look at all different aspects of your functioning. We really tease it apart and break down where the difficulties might be occurring and then how we can help support you in those areas. So we'll talk more about that together in our time today. All right, where is neuropsychology? So 
Generally, we think of neuropsychology as a clinical practice that happens in most commonly in outpatient settings, meaning you won't be staying overnight, but you'll come into a clinic, just like when you're seeing your neurologist, an outpatient clinic, to get the testing done. However, on occasion, you might undergo some brief neuropsychological testing while inpatient. For example, here at Hope, we occasionally test patients on our epilepsy monitoring unit when it can be relevant to have an updated snapshot of their cognitive functioning during their time in the hospital with us. Neuropsychologists also work in specialty clinics and settings. So for example, sometimes sports neuropsychologists might work in a team center for a professional sports team where they're doing evaluations right after a head injury or before the start of the season. You might also see us in different surgical suites if we're part of a surgical team that can help support your functioning and getting a sense of where your language or memory might be during a brain mapping procedure. You might see us in all kinds of different settings. I also want to mention that many neuropsychologists are also involved in training, both the next generation of neuropsychologists and teaching, either the graduate or undergraduate level. In terms of who you might see lurking around a neuropsychology clinic, you might see graduate students, which are practicum level doctoral trainees. You might see interns, which is our word in the neuropsychology world for residency, or postdocs who are fellows. They've graduated with their doctorate and are now completing that specialty training that I mentioned. As I mentioned earlier, a lot of neuropsychologists are also involved in research, clinical research, to help better your care. So many of us are also involved in numerous different trials or clinical um, experimentations of different sorts that involve some aspect of cognitive functioning. So many of us keep a hand in the world of research. And again, that we use that information to best support our patient's care. All right, so what is it that this very long eval tells us? Well, the reality is, is that most folks are not the best judge of their own ability. So let's take a, let's take a little poll here. How many of you watching at home who drive would say that you are a better than average driver? Any hands? Well, the reality is about 80% of folks would say that they are better than average driver. But statistically, that can't work out, right? That's not possible that 80% of folks can be better than average. The same is true in terms of us having perceptions of our own cognitive functioning. The research would tell us that our insight into our own cognitive functioning and behavior is actually quite limited. That might be why perhaps you notice that your spouse is having memory difficulties before your spouse notices it, right? So cognition on a whole, our thinking and our memory, is way more complex than most folks realize. I'll give you a few examples here. So one analogy that I often use in my practice is what's called a memory drawer. Does anyone have a junk drawer at home? If your house is anything like mine, it's probably in your kitchen. And it's probably that drawer that you open up that you have a whole bunch of different things in. Perhaps there's a set of keys that goes missing, and you know it's somewhere in that drawer, but it might take you a little bit of time to find it, right? Our memory works the same way. So there's a few things that can be wrong with our memory drawer here. I'll walk you through. So perhaps it might be difficult for you to get new things into that drawer. That drawer might feel really full and like you're having difficulty even opening it. Has anyone's junk drawer gotten stuck before where you can't even pull it out because it's so full or it's having so much uh, things in it that are keeping you from opening it? Well, that's similar to how sometimes our memory can be in that it's difficulty, it's difficult rather to get new information into that drawer. We call that a learning or encoding difficulty. Now, imagine that you're able to shove some of that paper that you want into that drawer, but you go back to open it later and you find there's nothing in the drawer. In fact, the whole bottom of the drawer has just fallen out. Well, that might be what we call a retrieval deficit, meaning you initially got the information into the drawer, but when you go to get it back out, the whole bottom of the drawer is gone. You can't find anything in there at all, right? Now, the other kind of issue that we have is what's called a recognition memory difficulty. So it might be that the drawer is still in the bottom when you go back to get that paperwork out, but it's super disorganized, right? You've got to really sort through it. You've got to put in one of those organizing dividers and kind of make your way through everything in order to find that paperwork. You know what's in there but you've got to really dig to find that paperwork or that set of keys. That's what we call a recognition difficulty, meaning that folks benefit from structure or cues or reminders to help them recall the information that we know is deep within their memory, but they might have difficulty freely pulling it back up. So as we mentioned earlier, a lot of different things can influence your cognition. Cognition is a fancy word for your thinking and your memory. So medical conditions like epilepsy certainly can impact your cognitive functioning. Also things like vitamin deficiencies, thyroid deficiencies, 
all kinds of hormonal or, or other imbalances in our body can impact our functioning overall. As we mentioned earlier, certainly emotional difficulties, so depression, anxiety, stress, all of those different aspects take up some of our available cognitive bandwidth, right? So when we think about our cognitive functioning day to day, just like your internet provider at home, we all have so much bandwidth, things like poor sleep, which is on our list here, emotional difficulties can take up some of that bandwidth. Tell you what I mean by that. If you've ever been at work and you've gotten perhaps some unfortunate news during your work day or while you're at school, it's really hard to focus for the rest of the day, right? Same thing if you've gotten a poor night's sleep. Let's say you were traveling or there was something going on at home and you didn't get a good night's sleep. The next day can be really torturous. It'd be really hard to focus on learning new information or staying alert in your class or at a meeting, for example. So our bandwidth is all impacted by the amount that we have going on in our life day to day, emotionally, physically, how we're doing overall impacts that available bandwidth of focus in terms of our cognitive uh, tasks or endeavors. So when can a neuropsych eval be helpful? Well, as we mentioned, sometimes your, neuro your neurologist might order a baseline eval. What that means is just getting a sense or characterizing your overall cognitive functioning to help us better understand where you are right now in time, right? Sometimes we might get a new baseline if there's been some recent changes in your medical history or your treatment options or your medications, for example. And then we can compare you to yourself down the road if you notice any changes in your thinking or your memory or there are additional changes in terms of your medical care. For example, sometimes neuropsych evals can be helpful in tracking the impact of medications or other surgical or other treatments. Certainly pre-surgically, your neurologist might send you for a full comprehensive workup to really characterize all aspects of your cognitive functioning so we can make sure that we're giving you the best possible options with your surgical endeavors. And then post-surgically, well, so generally neuropsychologists or neurologists rather might send you back our way six to nine months after an operation to see how things are healing, to see if there's been any impact that we need to address from the surgery that was unexpected or even when it is expected. The, the hope, as we mentioned, is that this neuropsychological eval can really characterize, get a good sense of how seizure activity might be impacting the actual functioning of these various regions of the brain. Sometimes your neurologist might think it would be helpful in certain situations to have what we call a sense of your capacity to do a number of what we call instrumental activities of daily living. What this means is, is sometimes there's question about someone's ability to manage their finances, to make legal decisions, to manage their medications independently. And so sometimes a, a neurologist will send you our way to get a good look of your, at your ability to do those activities. Most commonly, that's later in life for aging individuals. We can also help to give a sense of what might be useful in terms of that neurocognitive remediation or rehabilitation. So like we talked about a few minutes ago, what that means is it's the personal training that you do one-on-one -on -one with a specialty provider who has that training in neurocognitive uh, remediation. And they'll work with you. And our evaluation in terms of a comprehensive neuropsych eval can be really helpful at guiding the intervention, helping the individual who's working with you to know where your strengths and weaknesses are, where we really need to focus in, in strengthening or bolstering those areas that we saw on the testing that were below where your functioning was overall. Sometimes that neurocognitive eval can be done, I'm sorry, neurocognitive remediation can be done either in an individual setting, perhaps a group setting with other individuals who are working or targeting on the same issues or in support of other rehab professionals. So it might be in conjunction with speech and language therapy, for example, or occupational therapy, even recreational therapy. Sometimes we'll work alongside these different clinicians to help maximize your cognitive involvement, engagement, and what, uh, what positive impact you get from engaging in these therapies. So why? Why do we need all this information? What's the utility of this information? So, Neuropsych is really just one piece of the puzzle, but when we put it together with all the other clinical data, things like your brain imaging, your neurological exam from your neurologist, your history and presentation, which your neurologist will have and continually update, your epileptologist will have and continually update, we can get kind of a pattern here of strengths and weaknesses amongst both your cognitive and behavioral functions that again can guide treatment and help us get a sense of how to best support you and keep your brain as healthy as possible for as long as possible. 
sometimes neuropsychological evaluations might be requested to help get a better sense of differential diagnosis. So meaning that there might be a question, let's say, for individuals who have seizure activity, but may also have a long-standing weakness in a particular area, like attentional difficulties in a long-standing ADHD diagnosis. In those contexts, sometimes we can tease apart what might be due to the seizure activity based on where the seizures are originating in the brain versus what might be longer-standing learning difficulties or weaknesses in your cognitive functioning that may have been there. Same thing happens as we age, right? So occasionally folks will have epilepsy or seizure activity in the context of a neurodegenerative disease process like Alzheimer's dementia or vascular dementia. It can occasionally be helpful to have a comprehensive neuropsychological eval to tease apart the impact of those two comorbid conditions to get a better sense of what's going on for someone and again, how we can support them in terms of treatment moving forward. As we discussed, it can also reveal areas of daily functioning, things like medication management or driving that might be areas where we need to focus our treatment or have additional support for individuals. As talked about, this can also identify our targets in terms of treatment, rehabilitation, and intervention. So for example, will you benefit from having intensive treatment in a behavioral or cognitive therapy? Would occupational therapy be helpful? Would recreational therapy be helpful? We can get a better sense of that from looking at a detailed cognitive profile for how you're doing right now. And it can also help us as the healthcare providers and your loved ones, meaning your family and caregivers, to maybe help better communicate with you as, as the patient. How can we optimize your care by making sure that we're tailoring our approaches, our language, the level of what we're talking about to best suit your needs and communicate with you most effectively in these different contexts? So there's a large spectrum of the kind of breadth of cognitive assessment. So at the very simplest level, you might see that your neurologist or epileptologist is doing a brief screening in your time together. Sometimes this is called the many mental status exam or the MOCA. So that might be about five minutes in the office, generally done by either primary care provider, epileptologist, slash neurologist. There also then is kind of a, a, a range of the length and depth of which evals we will do as a neuropsychologist. So sometimes it's a brief eval, perhaps in an inpatient setting, just to get a snapshot of how you're doing at that point in time. A surgical eval, like we talked about, might be more comprehensive if you're considering your surgical candidacy, which procedures might be best for you. They might send you for a more in-depth assessment to get a detailed look at your cognitive functioning. And then when you come back after the surgery, we may not put you through the ringer in terms of all the tests again. We might spot check based on areas where we think the surgery has some impact or where there may have been changes that you've noticed since the surgery, both positive and or negative in terms of your cognitive functioning. I also want to mention that there are set batteries that we will occasionally use as part of those clinical trials. So this is when the, the battery of tests, the selection of tests is preset. We give that battery to each person so we can compare our interventions, our treatment, and kind of characterize how effective they are um, by using the same tool to measure each person. All right, so I think we've got a good sense of the background, but let's talk about the nuts and bolts of what actually happens during an eval, right? So if, it's, depending on the setting that you're in and the center that you're at, the length of the eval ranges. At our clinic, they generally run about four hours for a comprehensive neuropsych eval for pre-surgical candidacy. So I often get that the first question when folks walk in my door is, why am I here for four hours? What am I doing? Like, right? what could possibly take that amount of time? So I thought it might be helpful to break it down in a little more detail. So most evaluations begin with an interview. Generally, it's helpful to have information from someone who knows you well during that interview. So if possible, we'll invite a family member or a close friend, your spouse perhaps, or an adult child, whoever might be able to speak to what they've noticed in terms of changes in your cognitive functioning and how you're doing day to day in terms of your functional independence, things like medication, finances, driving. And during that interview, we'll ask both you and your loved one a lot of information about your background. So developmental information, meaning where you grew up, what kind of education you had, if there was any issues with your birth or your development as a young child, educational functioning, meaning not just how many years of schooling you had, but how you did as a student. If you had any difficulty learning to read or write, attentional difficulties or behavioral issues as a child. Certainly ask if you're working about your occupational functioning, how things are going, what kind of difficulties you've noticed at work, perhaps as a result of your epilepsy or otherwise, 
We'll also ask about your psychiatric functioning, so how you're doing emotionally presently. And then if there's been any uh, past history of any times in your life where you've needed additional support from psychotherapy or psychoactive medications to help impact your mood or emotional functioning overall. We'll also talk about your current emotional functioning as well in more depth, so not just how you're doing overall emotionally, but if there's symptoms of sadness or anxiety day to day, if you're worried about your health um, setting, if that's impacting perhaps your sleep or your functioning at home or at work or at school, we'll get a better kind of context for how you're doing and, and what impact those different symptoms, both cognitive and emotional, might have on your day-to-day -day life. Okay. Along that, as we've been kind of touched on here, we'll get a really detailed assessment from you in terms of where you're seeing the subjective impact of the current cognitive symptoms. So many folks will mention that they've noticed changes in maybe their ability to pay attention or concentrate. They might feel like their processing speed is slower, takes them longer to process information. They might notice changes in their memory functioning or their ability to learn new information. And during this evaluation, we'll also be getting a sense of who you are and how you're doing from our behavioral standpoint, too. So, for example, if someone's having difficulty remembering my name or perhaps they can't find their way back out to the bathroom when we take a break. Um, if they're having difficulty holding on to instructions for the different puzzles or games or tasks that we give them. They're having difficulty coming up with the right word in conversation or perhaps understanding or comprehending the questions that I'm asking them and their family members. That's all clinical data that can be really useful in helping us select which tests to give during the testing portion and also get a better sense of what might be going on in terms of the day-to-day -day impact. All right, so then the testing portion, right? It sounds more, more daunting than it is. Most folks find it's not too bad, but it's a series of puzzles and games and tasks, all kinds of different things. So drawing, remembering, oral activities like repeating digits forwards and backwards, getting word lists. But typically these are done with pencil and paper, just like when you were back in school. But some tests might be given on a computer or even a tablet. Some tests might be self-report questionnaires that might ask about your mood functioning or changes you notice day to day, but most will be administered by a neuropsychologist or a trained skilled technician, perhaps a practicum level doctoral trainee or a, a technician who has specialty training in administering these exams. And the neuropsychological tests are all standardized. What that means is, is we are tasked with giving the instructions to every individual that we test in the same exact way. Occasionally, it can seem a little robotic or a little stiff. We want to make sure that we give these tests to the same way to every person, and then we can get a better sense of any variability or difference in your performance when compared to the other population uh, norm, meaning other folks your same age and education range. And our tests, as we mentioned, look at the brain's ability to carry out a given function. We'll break that down a little more. Some tests might be challenging. Generally, they're designed to get harder as you go along. So I have everyone tell me that some things were easier, some things were harder. We all have natural strengths and weaknesses. And you might be a math person, for example, or more of a literature person or language person. So there might be some natural aptitude that plays into that as well. Some of the tests will be timed and others are not timed. Some tests might ask you to think in a way that you're not used to thinking. So kind of going back to your school days, if it's been a while since you've been out of it, so you might find it that it's a bit of a brain activity or exercise to get you going in these different areas. And how we select the tests that we get. So our, our uh, evaluation is put together, the battery of tests that we use, as we call it, is put together based on what the question from the referring doctor, generally your epileptologist, neurologist, and what you want to know. So what you tell us during the interview in terms of changes that you've noticed, your areas of impact you might see day to day, all of those different pieces inform what we use then to put together our test and what we get a deep dive look at. Also, as I mentioned, if during the testing, I'm sorry, during the interview portion rather, you're having difficulty remembering my name or difficulty comprehending the questions I'm asking, I might put in additional measures to get a look at your language functioning, for example, in more depth. The other thing that we do is we look at all of the areas that might be impacted by a given referral question or kind of area of curiosity. So pretty generally in epilepsy, what we'll get a look at is your attention, your working memory, which is your ability to hold information in the moment, manipulate it, and give it back to me, your processing speed, which is how quickly you can make use of information in your environment in a meaningful way, your le learning and your memory, 
your language functioning, both your receptive, meaning how well you understand what I'm saying to you, and your expressive, meaning how well you're able to articulate your thoughts and come up with words and conversation. Your visual spatial functioning, your executive functioning, that's higher level tasks like planning, sequencing, organizing, abstract reasoning, multitasking, all kinds of and judgment I should mention as well across the board. And we also look at your motor functioning. So as we know, sometimes epilepsy can cause motoric slowing between your right and your left hand. There might be some lateralization, meaning one side might be more impacted than the other. So we'll also ask you to do a few motor speed tasks. And then your mood functioning. So of course, having a serious health condition like epilepsy can impact anyone's mood. So we want to get a sense of kind of how you're feeling emotionally and what kind of emotional burden there might be as a result of the seizure activity in particular. All right, so let's talk a little bit more about the cognitive domains. These are our domains of thinking and memory in terms of how we break this down and what we explore. So the brain is modular. What I mean by that is that we generally have areas of the brain that are responsible for various functions, right? But it's also networked, meaning there are connections between those areas, neuronal connections, paths of neurons that connect those areas. So we might see impact in other areas of the brain outside of just that one area where we typically think of memory living, for example. But in general, different regions of our brain have specific tasks, and then there might be some additional support areas that also help to uh, augment the functioning of that one area. So there are a few different parts of the brain I just want to highlight here using that visual. So there's the frontal lobe, the frontal part of our brain that helps us get a good sense of, again, a lot of our attention, our working memory, our executive functions tend to originate from that part of the brain. There's our parietal lobe in yellow there. What this can help us do is get a sense of where we are in space. So things like proprioception can also give us a sense of how things move in our environment around us, our visual spatial functioning and visual spatial integration. Gives us also a sense of where things are in space objectively outside of our own body, but objects around us in our environment. Our temporal lobe most um, famously is involved quite heavily in language and memory functioning. So that's where quite a few of those functions live. Our occipital lobe, which is where our visual inputs connect to, so get us a good sense of um, making sense of faces, of shapes in our environment, what objects are, being able to tell that a water bottle is a water bottle, for example. And then our cerebellum, which is at the very back of the brain at the base there, which can help with things like balance, our autonomic functions, the things we don't think about, blinking our eyes, our heart beating, our breath pattern, and our stabilization. All right, so what comes out of the neuropsych valve? Well, first off, we generally get an estimate of your pre-morbid, meaning prior to any insult or injury, baseline intellectual functioning. This helps us adjust our anchor point in terms of where we would expect your cognitive functioning to be across other domains, like memory, attention, learning. And then the way that we structure our neuropsych evaluation is hierarchical in nature, meaning that if you're having difficulty paying attention, of course, that difficulty with attention might then impact your other areas of functioning, right? Like your processing speed or your learning. So we try to tease apart what might be due to an attentional difficulty rather than what we're kind of picking up in our signal to noise ratio on these other aspects of cognitive functioning. I'll give you another example. So if we notice that someone is unable to comprehend what we're saying to them, then of course they're not going to understand the task instructions across my visual spatial measures. So it might look like a visual spatial deficit or difficulty, but in fact, they're having difficulty with their language, which is why I'm getting this um, kind of air signal about their visual spatial functioning. So we try to take that into account when we're interpreting the whole of someone's cognitive profile. As I mentioned, language is super important, right? So if someone's having a language difficulty that changes some of the tools or measures we'll use, we can try to isolate what we might be seeing. And then we use a flexible approach in most cases. Most neuropsychologists use a flexible battery rather than a fixed battery, meaning that based on how the testing is going, I might adjust the measures that I'm giving you, give you different tests or different tasks to do. I might, of course, um, make edits or updates to the testing based on what we see in the room to best accommodate so that I can get a full comprehensive look at how you're doing cognitively overall. 
All right, let's talk about the various domains of cognitive functioning and how they're assessed. So as we mentioned, first up, we get a baseline pre-morbid IQ. This test is not sensitive to acquired brain dysfunction. So if you had a head injury, for example, or if there was some sort of illness that caused some inflammation in your brain, generally then this does not change. This is fixed or crystallized across your lifespan once you're an adult, so it does not change. So it gives us like a pretty um, solid starting point so that we can compare you to where we think you were prior to any disease, illness, or injury. We also look at your orientation, and that's when you are, where you are, and who you are. So do you know what day it is, what month it is, what week it is, what clinic we're in? We also get to look at your processing speed. So these are generally simple time tasks. Also, some of those tasks will have a motor speed component. We get a good look at your attention, so both your auditory attention, how able you are to attend to what I'm saying in the moment. This lecture might be a perfect example of that. And then your visual attention as well, so how able are you to scan and quickly pick out um, different stimuli or targets in your visual uh, field. Memory, so we talked a bit about this, but essentially we look at both verbal and nonverbal, or what we call visual memory. And we look at the three components we talked about. So learning, your ability to encode or immediately recall that information. Delayed recall, so after a delay, maybe 20, 30 minutes, how able are you to pull out information that we've requested of you without any cues or help? And then your recognition. If I give you a longer list of words, for example, can you pick out the words that were on the original list that I asked you to learn uh, before previously? So let's do a little example here. I will ask you to read these words. So lemon, window, green, telephone. Let's do it again. Lemon, window, green, telephone. Okay, now tell me all of the words you can remember from that list. All right, let's do it again. Lemon, window, green, telephone. Tell me all the words you can recall from that list. All right, and how about now? Can you do it again? Tell me all the words you can remember from that list. Awesome. Okay. So that's an example of our immediate learning trials there. We'll have you hold on to that information. Now, I want you to repeat this list back. Door, lemon, television, blue. Can you tell me that list? That's right, the second list. What word was on both lists? That's right, you got it, awesome. All right, hold on to that information. Moving right along, let's look at how we check out language functioning. So language comprehension, that's our ability to understand what's being said to us. So we might ask you to follow some commands or understand complex sentences. Your fluency, so a few different kinds of fluency, your phonemic fluency, your ability to generate words that start with a certain letter. Your semantic fluency, your ability to generate lists of words that give us certain categories of items. And then just in conversation, how fluent are you when we're having a conversation back and forth during our interview? Can you converse? Can you respond to the questions? Can you say the thought that you're having? Can you take that thought and put it into words? We might also ask you to repeat information back to us, words or sentences. We might ask you to name pictures that we show you or auditory sounds that you're hearing just to test what we call your semantic knowledge as well. We might also look at your visual spatial functioning, so constructions, we might have you make some designs with blocks, draw certain figures, copy other figures, and then your perception, so how able you are to discern visual stimuli, uh, locations, uh, perception of overall visual input as well. Then as you mentioned, your executive functioning, that's higher level tasks, will do some inhibition tasks, which require you to inhibit your first response, play by a new set of rules and give us information back. Your set shifting, that's most akin to multitasking, so your ability to go back and forth between two different tasks. Your working memory might also be an aspect of that as well. And then your abstract reasoning here. Let's give you a few examples coming up. This is our visual spatial mental rotation task. You'll see on the far side here, on the far left, 
I want you to tell me which of these numbers matches the figure. You might have to rotate the piece in your mind here. So the example is underlined in red, which one, one, two, three, or four matches that figure. Take a moment to look at that. How do we do? Yeah, okay, correct answer. That's right, number four is the correct answer, excellent. All right, and then here, so looking at the far left side, tell me what objects you see overlapping here. Can anyone tell me what they see? Fred, I heard a fork and a wine bottle. Yep, a bread basket maybe, cup, tea kettle. Awesome, you've got your ability to see multiple things at once. Same question here for our uh, figure in the middle, our quite colorful one there. What do you see? That's right. You see a man made of multiple fruits, flowers, and fauna, but it's a man that's comprised of different vegetables and uh, a different uh, fauna overall. All right, and then on our far right, what do you see here? Two things. That's right, you see the letter A, a big A, made up of tiny E's, right? So excellent work. Everyone's able to see those, hopefully. Let's talk about your inhibition. So can everyone tell me the color of the text of the word printed here? Don't read the word itself, but tell me the color of the text. We should have what? Green, red, blue, right? So inhibiting your first response to read the word and giving me the color of the text. All right, how about some abstract reasoning? So try a proverb here. An old ox plows a straight row. What do we mean by that? Any ideas? Talk amongst yourselves. Yeah, that's right, right. So experience and having the wisdom of age can help us to do our task efficiently and effectively because we've got that experience under our belt. So those are some examples of those various domains we might test. It's important to look at all these different aspects of cognitive functioning because as we mentioned, these different functions actually live or are localized to certain parts of the brain that then help us get a sense of where there might be damage or impact from the seizures. There's no pass or fail on a test. I wanna be sure I'm, I'm clear about that. So it's not a, a winner takes all or black and white but it gives us a pattern, a nuance in terms of strengths and weaknesses that can be helpful in terms of, again, highlighting what might be due to long-standing weakness, what might be due to new seizure activity or recent seizure activity, what might be due to medication effects, for example, what might be due to a surgical intervention or improve because of a surgical intervention. We're trying to understand the impact of the epilepsy and get a better sense of treatment planning as a result. So, if you do well overall, but you do poorly on just a few tests that measure that same function, then the neuropsychologist might be able to speak to the areas of your brain that are not working as expected. That may be where the seizures then are originating from. Also mentioned as part of our testing, we get a good look at somebody's ability to fully give their cognitive engagement. So like we talked about, things like mood difficulties or sleep might impact our ability to fully give our cognitive effort or attention. And so throughout the test, embedded within our test are also measures that look at somebody's ability to engage cognitively to make sure we're getting an accurate uh, picture of how someone's doing. We touched on this a bit earlier, but as I mentioned, there are more and more tests that are moving towards computer-based or tablet-based administration. And so the benefit of some of these evaluations is that we can capture more specific details. So for example, the computer can absolutely perfectly time you whereas I might be slightly off in my timing. You can also detect impairments from different motor symptoms or the way you interact with the keyboard or the stylus or the flywheel. And then we can use these kinds of tests to do spot checks kind of more briefly to track the progression of perhaps your epilepsy or to monitor different treatment responses across time. These computerized tests are also available in multiple languages, so it's really an asset for folks that might not um, be primary English speakers. There's a few examples of these different types of tests that you may have encountered. So one's called CNS Vital Signs or Cognizate. So there's many coming down the pike that you might encounter in your epileptologist or neurologist office as well. All right, so then what happens after the testing? So after you're done with testing, you're exhausted, you go home for a good night's sleep, and we get busy on our end. So what we do is we score everything up, we 
compare you to other men or women of your same age and education range who are known to be cognitively and emotionally healthy. And what we're looking at is how you perform compared to that same normative group, meaning that peer group that we just mentioned. And the goal is also to get a sense of if you've been tested before, we can then compare you to yourself, which is why that baseline testing can be so helpful in terms of characterizing changes in cognitive functioning. And we integrate the data from our actual individual testing along with the information that we got from our interview of you, from the medical records, from your epileptologist or neurologist, and then we generate a report that we give back to the uh, referring physician in terms of what might be helpful. Sometimes the neuropsychologist might also provide you a copy of that report. And that report specifically has your history and your background, so what you shared with us in terms of cognitive, emotional, physical concerns, a summary of the results from our testing, and then we integrate that information with brain scans, your neurocognitive exam in terms of your neurological functioning, what we know about your seizures and where they're occurring in EEG data. We pull all of that together to get a sense of both where you're at cognitively right now and then how that maps onto what we're seeing in terms of your um, brain imaging, your EEG data, and all the pieces. And there we make some recommendations of what might be helpful in terms of optimizing your cognitive care. And we might invite you to come back to see us to go through the findings and for feedback, or the neurologist or epileptologist might pass along that information for you, for us, I should say, to you. And then we might do repeat testing across time to track changes, particularly after surgical intervention or if there's been any change in medication across time. And the goal here is that this information can help to inform your treatment for other members of the treatment team and help us, again, uh, support you in doing your very best in terms of your actual cognitive functioning day to day and your overall quality of life. So the goal is to get a, a sense of your strengths and weaknesses so we can also get a sense of where we might need to fill in some of the gaps in terms of areas that are not strengths for you and helping to provide additional supports or bolster those areas. We also can determine if those changes are normal or within expectation for what we might expect based on your seizure activity, your medication treatment, your surgical intervention. Or this might be out of step with what we might expect, and if we might need to adjust some of the medications or treatments accordingly. And then we'll also make recommendations to ensure safety and maximize your independence. Our goal is always to keep you as independent as possible while being safe and being mindful, of course, that we don't want any harm to the volume. Ah, okay, here's the kicker. You remember that word list that I read to you, the one that we read several times, not the second word list, but the first list. The words that we went over several times or a few times together. Okay. Oh, I give you a minute earlier. Everyone say that list out loud. Okay, now which words from these two pages or two columns here were on the original list? Was bananas on the list? Telephone? How about wall? Blue? Roof? Lemon? Door? Orange, date, pink, window, computer, cherry, watermelon, peaches, balcony, teal, green, television, microwave. How did you do? Did you get them? Awesome. Good job. All right, so just to bring this home here, what are we looking for in terms of what we call neuropsychological signatures in epilepsy? That's the pattern of performance across the cognitive domain and how you do in each area. So the short answer is, is it depends. Most commonly, it depends on where your focus of seizure or foci, plural, are coming from. But based on how you do on testing, we might get a sense if there's a suspected brain region that might be responsible for the seizure output. So for example, if your seizures are starting in your hippocampus, or plural, hippocampi, then you might see a greater impact on your memory functioning. Generalized seizures might have more of an impact on your processing speed, your attention, your working memory. So these different tests and cognitive signatures, signatures can help us localize in terms of what areas might be impacted by the seizure functioning. We also want to exclude mimics. So what is this image in the middle look like? Looks like a leaf, right? But it is, in fact, as you can see there, a bug, an insect of sorts. So what I mean by that with excluding mimics is we want to make sure we take into consideration any impact of mood or psychosocial stress. Of course, poor quality sleep can also impact. We'll take the whole of who you are, 
where you are, what's going on in your life to get a good sense of what might be due to these other factors, what might be due to the epilepsy. All right, and then making sense of our neuropsych assessment here and making good use of it. So as we talked about, changes that might recur, occur rather as a result, you might have different recommendations in terms of your treatment team and what they would suggest for medication interventions, surgical considerations, and treatment making uh, decisions. Cognitive remediation, so that's personal training one-on-one, -on -one, but cognitive training piece to help strengthen or bolster the areas where we see weakness on your cognitive functioning. And then also that individual might also work with you to give compensatory strategies. Other cues, help, external structures, things like calendar reminders on your phone, using your smart home device to remind you to change the laundry or bring up the trash cans or pick up your kids. Other kinds of supports that might be available, I guess, through technology or good old-fashioned post-it note reminders to help you best optimize your cognitive function given some of the challenges we saw in testing. Sometimes these evaluations, neuropsych assessments, can be helpful in terms of accommodations or work environments or school settings. Uh, somebody needs extended time on testing or might benefit from having a note taker or being able to record conversations or meetings. Also, there might be some benefit from emotional support. So as we talked about with epilepsy, there's a lot of emotional involvement from these different conditions. And of course, your health um, being a, such an emotional topic overall. So it might be helpful to have some support from a psychotherapist or a support group or other individual to help kind of walk alongside you through these moments. We might also make some lifestyle recommendations as well. So changes specifically about sleep and your overall quality of sleep, cognitive activity, physical activity and social activity, which is what we know from the research can help to optimize cognitive functioning and keep you as healthy as possible. So on a whole, we'll take into consideration where you are, how you're doing, and how we can make recommendations to best optimize your cognitive functioning while maximizing your independence as much as possible and making sure that you stay safe. All right, that brings me to the end of my time with you. Thanks so much for your attention and thanks for playing along with my uh, different games and puzzles along the way. It was a pleasure to be with you all, and I hope you're enjoying the programming. All right, take care.